All right, welcome back uh, from the break. CS 4510 L1A, L1B. This is the second half of Tuesday, and the first day of class. Uh, the title of today's lecture is called Deterministic Finite Automata. We're going to give a uh, An example of such a computing device. Uh, we, last time we mentioned set builder notation. We talked about um, what it means for a problem. What is a problem? What is a decision problem? Uh, we formulated these as languages, as sets of strings. Um, uh, one quick thing I want to mention is we have the language uh, w and sigma star such that int w2 is prime. So, um, Certainly, any machine that can decide this language that this has the ability to distinguish the good from the bad, you give it a, an encoding of a prime number, it says yes. You give it an, an encoding of not a prime number, it says no. Any machine that has the ability to decide this language has the uh, ability of primality testing. Right? It has, it's basically an algorithm, right, in some sense, of what primality testing is. But uh, importantly, it's not the only way to make sure a machine has primality testing. Because when you write a number on the board, right? We write, let's say we write 17. Um, 17 is a prime number, but it's also not a prime number. That's a string. That's a sequence of two symbols, a 1 and a 7, from a finite alphabet of size 10, that we use to assign, to associate with the idea of the quantity 17. And then we say, when we say 17 is prime, we don't actually mean the sequence the string, the sequence of symbols that we write on the board. We actually mean the quantity represented by those sequence of symbols. 17, the idea of 17, the quantity itself is prime. But it's not the only way to write down that quantity. What is 17 in binary? It's going to be like 16 plus 1. So let's say that's 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, right? Those are that's another sequence of symbols for the same idea. But it's, it's independent of the way that we actually write down that idea. The fact these are both prime, right? But they're, they're not, not only prime, but they're equal. But they are just different representations of the same thing. In the same way, when we choose an alphabet, it doesn't really matter. Right? That's the, probably the best alphabet simply because computers use that. Now, how does a computer use more than this, right? How does a s computer represent like symbols on your screen or whatever, with ASCII at least? ASCII is actually just... Uh, a way to represent a sequence of binary digits into a sequence, a, a single letter, right? So if you were able to do whatever a theory of computation you're going to develop on an alphabet that wasn't binary, necessarily you could probably cast it back down to binary, and you'd be fine. Um, for convenience, we'll normally do A, B, simply because uh, it, zeros and ones can get confusing, right? When you put exponentiations and concatenations and things in there. But, so we'll usually use A, B instead of 0 and 1. But don't get confused when I say uh, a string encoding of a prime number in terms of A, B. That shouldn't be too complicated for you. right? That would be just, I don't know, B, A, 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 B. It's the same. That's also a prime number, quote unquote. Right? The, the problems we want to study have nothing to do with the way we represent them. We are just simply limited by the fact that we have to write things down. So we need a way to represent the ideas. So unfortunately, we have to use strings. And then, therefore, we have to choose some alphabet. So the way all problems are defined is we're sort of abstracted away from the alphabet. No one ever talks about the fact that there's only 10 digits. That's sort of a, the reason. That's only true because we have 10 fingers. You know? That's the only reason we use base 10. Um, but the, the objects of study have nothing to do with fingers. Uh, in the same way, the languages we want to study, for the most part, will have nothing to do with the alphabet. We just sort of Im implicitly say that the alphabet is this, and then we just keep going. Right? Here, the alphabet here. Uh, with, if unsaid, if unmentioned, it's usually a, this alphabet of size 2 of AB. Right. Questions on this one before we get into the definition today, the important stuff? Right, so an automata, so what is a, a let's give some inspiration from like uh, sentient beings without thought, things that perhaps perform action but do not think about it. I have a pet rabbit, uh, like this. Like a bat. Still looks like a bat. Okay. Um, it's 
currently in its midlife crisis. It's like 45 in rabbit years. And it uh, only has like two brain cells at once. But they, it, the two brain cells don't take up the same. They can't, they, they can't, it can't use both brain cells at once. It can only use one brain cell at a time. So the two brain cells are eating and sleeping. And it so only can alternate between these two states. It has no ability to learn or is encouraged to modify its behavior in any way or anything like this. It simply transitions between these two states of being, these states of mind, according to sensory inputs. Um, and in some sense, the rabbit is not much smarter than like a, one of those doors that opens when you walk in front of it at the grocery store. Um, but we can simulate it. Uh, we can sort of describe it uh, an interpolation between these two states using its inputs. So let's suppose it is currently, it's always currently in some state, and it receives additional input. If you're in the state of eating, eating and you see food, do you swap states, or would you think that it would stay eating? It would continue to eat. So we may write that as an arrow like this, and the arrow represents I'm moving from one state to another. So if it sees food, it's going to continue in the state. Now, what happens if there's no food? It's going to fall asleep. There's no food. It, it finished the food. It's going to fall asleep. Now, what happens if it was asleep and it smells food? It's going to wake up and start eating. Now, what happens if it was asleep and there was no food? It stays sleeping, right? So... Basically, a sequence of sensory inputs can determine which brain cell it's, is occupying the front of its mind at that moment. And this is, in some sense, a very limited computer. This is something maybe you've seen before in another class, a state machine, right? You guys seen a state machine in some other class? I always ask, what class is that? 2110. 2110. I never learned state machines in 2110. Or at least I wasn't paying attention. But uh, this class, basically the first third of this class is going to be on state machines. So that is an automata, it turns out. Uh, Immediately notice two things. One, the brain cell occupying the mind is, has, is memoryless. It has no idea how many carrots it saw previously. It has no idea what the last thing it did was. It simply knows what it's doing at the moment of its sensory input. It's very local. Um, but we can use this as a sort of string exception, accepting device. We can create what's called a deterministic finite automata. A deterministic, well, I already wrote it there, so I'm just going to say DFA. A DFA is defined uh, as, as a tuple. We have Q, we have sigma, we have Q0, we have delta, and we have F. And we'll talk about extensively what these things are. Q is a finite set of states. Perhaps it's Q0 to QK. This is the common notation we'll use. Q subscript the index of that specific state. A sigma is a finite set of symbols. Perhaps it's AB. Right? It's part of the automata. This is, a, in some sense, a program specification. Q0 is some element of Q which is a designated start state. We have to enter our computation somewhere. So why not just say, arbitrarily, I choose to enter here? That is Q0. Uh, now, all the other parts are static, if you think <coughs> about it so far. The states don't move, the symbols don't move, and the start state doesn't move. Computation as an action has to move. The important part, then, is going to be what this, what's called the transition function. The transition function allows you to move between states. It's a finite function in the sense it operates from uh, a finite set to a finite set, uh, and outputs an element of a finite set. It takes on a single state, a single symbol, and outputs a single state. When we define DFAs, we'll understand this more rigorously, but this is the formal definition of what the transition function is. The transition function moves you from state to state as you read symbols. Uh, finally, F is just some subset of Q, is the accepting states. Now, a DFA, how does a DFA compute? Where's the computation actually occurring? 
We say D on input W accepts if uh, D lands on an accepting state after repeated uh, applications of delta. So basically, you repeatedly apply delta to the DFA, and you will land on an accepting state. Now, that formal definitions are never quite useful until you see an example. Yeah? Is it if and only if, or just if? If and only if. Okay. Yeah, it's the definition. So I'll, I'll rather than say if and only if, I'll say that's the definition. Um, so the accepting states are the ones that accept, necessarily, if it ends on those. Uh, let's just give a DFA for uh, a language, and then let's just talk about its computation. We'll, we'll go through it. So consider um, L is W is in sigma star. Uh, w begins with an A. So what we're going to do is define a set of finite states and alternate between the states depending upon uh, the strings we want to accept or not. So what we're going to start with some somewhere. We'll call this the start. This is going to be Q0. Okay? Q0 is always the start state. Um, now, when we see an A, we apply delta. We're going to have what are called defined outgoing transitions. So the way we'll represent this is using uh, an arrow from one state to another. So what I'm going to do is draw two other states, Q1 and Q2. If we see an A, we go to Q1. If we see a B, we go to Q0. Uh, we go to Q2. Okay. Now, which one of these should be the accepting state? Q1. Q1. The way we'll denote this is with a double circle. The double circle means that's accepting. Not a double circle means that's not accepting. Um, we're not done. There's some problems here. What happens, when you, what happens is as you run the DFA on the string, you go from one state to another state to another state to another state to another state, and then you end. When you're out of letters to read, that is where the computation ceases. That's where you stop. There's a problem with this DFA already. What happens when you compute on this DFA of a string of length two or more? What happens to the string AA? Not defined. So we need to define it. AA is in the language. So we want to accept AA. So what do we do? We're going to self-loop. If we see an A or a B, we're going to stay in Q1. Same thing in Q2. Let's talk a little bit more about the programming here. Is Q2 accepting? No. It's not accepting. You reach Q2 if you begin with a B. Is Q0 accepting? When should Q0 be accepting, by the way? What strings end on Q0 always? The empty string. The empty string has no symbols, so you do not leave Q0, so you stay at Q0. So Q0 should not be accepting. Why? Because the language as defined does not, does not contain the empty string. Does the empty string begin with an A? No, because it doesn't begin with anything. So the empty string is not defined in this language. Now. Notice also the behavior of what happens. In this, in this uh, automata, you go to basically two purgatories. And when you are there, you cannot leave. You cannot transition. You cannot move anywhere else. You're forever stuck in those two uh, waste baskets. Once, all that matters in this specific DFA is the first symbol. Nothing else matters, right? This is, we would say, a correct DFA for... Uh, this language. So this DFA defines this language, right? Questions on this one? Yeah. Is there a reason that um, DFAs have like multiple final states? Why can't we just have like one like halt state or like or accept state? Some DFAs, as we'll see today, are easier to have multiple final states. Consider a state like a line of code in a program, and consider the transitions like a jump instruction. You can have multiple return trues in your code, but Maybe you could only, only have one. That's also fine. 
you'll see as uh, you'll see some examples where it's like I don't know how to do this deterministically with only one accept state. Is it impossible, or is it just hard to do? Um, there are some DFAs that are impossible to do with. We'll do an example even today. We'll, we won't be able to prove that it has. Uh, there is no other DFA of one state, one accept state or less. But it like it's the way it will be constructed will be obvious. Yeah. The delta is like this tiny unit of work, and it's just like moving the cursor. Yeah, there. That's a great way to think of it. Is a cursor. Delta, in some sense, is a finite is a finite function. Delta takes as input a state and a symbol and outputs a state. So let's actually, it's, it's a finite function. So it's really just a lookup table. Let's just define what it is. Uh, Q0, Q0, Q1, Q1, Q2, Q2, A, B, A, B, A, B. For this specific DFA, Q0, A is what? Q1. Q1. You're at Q0. You see an A, you go to Q1, right? The, the, this is just like a nice way to represent a DFA. But formally, it's this table thing, right? If we were to fill in the rest of the table, what would we do? Q0B would be Q2. Q1A would be? Yeah. Q1B would be? Q2A would be? Q2. And Q2B would be? Q2. So this is a finite function. Finite set, finite set, outputs finite set, right? It's well defined. We had to make sure that basically when we didn't have these self loops where there was a bunch of empty things in this in this last column here, we had to fill them in. It always must be defined where you go. Yeah. So because all of our words are of finite length, you can never get stuck in an infinite loop, right? Not only that, the, how long does the computation take? Exactly the length of the word. It takes exactly the length of the word. In some sense, a DFA, let's make an analogy between a DFA and a real program, like a real code. Like if you were to write code for this. First thing is, the, what's the runtime of this? O not even O of n. It's faster than that. Well, it's not faster than that, but it is that. There's a, there's a more spe specific one. It's not simply O of n, but it's, it's what's called real time. It takes n steps, not even O of n steps. Oh, meaning it's like one time rather than... Yeah, not like 3n. Right. Something weird, yeah. It literally takes... O of n, it's not O of n, n steps, okay? Exactly n, not n plus 1, n, n, 3n, whatever, right? It's literally n steps. Exactly one computation step occurs per letter of the alphabet, okay? Second thing, how much space did this algorithm use? This is a debatable question because we're going to take us a lot later in the semester to formalize what does that even mean? What is the space, what is the measure of space that an algorithm uses? But if you were to write this as code, um, it takes no space. These states, you may think, well, it takes finite space because each state is one unit of space, maybe. But that I would consider that part of the program code. And you don't measure the code of the program when it, you measure the space that it uses. So it actually takes no space. And there's another limitation here between this kind of construction of automata and like a real... Uh, language is that it must read uh, left to right. That's pretty bad. That's like a big limitation. Like if you are actually taking in and write a program for it, you could jump to the middle of the string. You could jump to the end of the string. You could loop backwards through the string. You could do pre-processing. You could do post-processing. The DFA is not allowed to do any of that. When you design a DFA like death, you have to be prepared for the DFA to end at any moment. The state that it lands on is it. That's over. There's no like, well, I'm going to just you know, clean up, my, you know, free my malloc, whatever. I'm just going to, it's over. That's where you are. Right? In some sense, this is a very limited kind of programming language. Um, and we're simply going to use the DFA as a sort of a toy model to study more complicated automata. But they're very interesting in their own right. You'll, your homework will be like, there will be many languages you'll be given. You'll have to write DFAs for them. Any questions on this DFA before we do several more examples? Yeah. When you say zero space, you got to that because each step doesn't care about the previous step? Um, that's another observation. It is local. But notice that this computer does not have access to RAM. It doesn't, in a, in a more trivial sense, there's nowhere for it to write anything down. Well, what I mean by that is all it cares about is Q and sigma. It doesn't need any other stuff. There's nowhere for it to write and recall. It, you can think of it as it has a vari one variable, 
which can only contain one value at a time from a finite set, which is the current state it is at, the current mind. And that's it. There is no device, and this will make sense as we see more complicated automata. There is no external memory structure for it to work on. Like a program can write variables and malloc and do all kinds of weird stuff, independent of where the where the control flow currently is. And, and like, because I'm trying to like map this onto like programming stuff. It's like th the state is not state. It's a pointer. It's like a number that says what state we're at. You know when you're writing, when you know when you read code and only one line of code is done at a time. Right. That's the pointer. Yeah, it's not the code itself. It's, yes. It's the state. State number three. Exactly. That would be like code of line, yeah. line code three. Now, the DFA can only remember finitely many things at once, but that's okay because you can, to each state, you can assign a semantic meaning. If you have some DFA structure that looks like this, something like this, and let's say I'm missing some parts around it, okay? There's a meaning to this, a structure like this. If you're at this state, that means you just previously saw an A. You agree? If you're at this state, that means you just previously saw an A from the state that previously saw an A. So that means if you're at the state, you know the last two symbols you saw were A. So that's a constant amount of information that can be kept looking backwards. But that's it. Only a constant amount of, of an arbitrarily long string. Right? This is sort of analogous to doing like if A, if A, and then to do, right? whatever. If you're at this line of code, you know you pass these two if statements. The same thing. Yeah. yeah. That every time you rerun the transition function, you're moving on to the next letter. Is that is really hard to like mathematically formalize, so I just said it in words. Okay. Would you believe me? Yeah. That's true. I repeated, I through successive applications of the transition function. Here's one I think I could do. I could say delta q0. Uh, let's run this, let's run this DFA on like A B B. Okay. Where does that count computation land? You go from q0 to q1. And then from Q1 to Q1. And then you stop and you accept. What, the way mathematically, unfortunately, the way you would write this is like Q0A uh, would be what? Q1. So then you take delta of that, B, and then you take delta of that, B. Right? That's not nice. <laughs> so, but you, you, you understand, right? Um, Here's a final thing, uh, one final comment before we just give more examples of DFAs. The DFA, unfortunately, has been tasked with processing arbitrarily long strings. We're concerned with its behavior on infinitely many inputs simultaneously. We agree that this is the, it, it exactly and only decides that language, right? The DFA is a very humble device. It has, it's, only, it's a short description. I mean, it's really small to describe. But its behavior is on infinitely many inputs, which are arbitrarily long and sometimes much longer than it. Right? Think, this is true for every algorithm, though. Dijkstra's algorithm is of constant size. It's only like 15, 20 lines of code, whatever. But you can run Dijkstra's algorithm on a graph that is trillions and trillions of nodes large. So the size, a, a compiler is constant in the size of the input. The input, the whole Linux kernel, whatever, can comp the small, tiny uh, compiler can compile the entire kernel, whatever. It can, can compile things much bigger of it. So we are asking a lot of, a, of an automata. We're asking for its behavior on infinitely many inputs. And in some sense, this is an association between a finite object and an infinite set. And that's sort of the whole point of the class. The DFA, in some sense, is a description of the language. This is the device to decide the language. The DFA, in some sense, is the definition of the language. So, but it's a finite definition of an infinite object. Yes? Do all DFAs have zero space? Um, sure. We don't say that they have any, we, we're making like a programming language analogy, and it's almost like we don't concern ourselves with the space, but it's just an analogy we make to the program. Okay. You can suppose, as we define other automata that will have space, you'll be like, yeah, obviously that has no space. But for now, we don't even, we can maybe not even ask the question. Okay. Yeah. More questions on this one before we get to more examples? All right, let's do this one and let's try to, I'll give you like 60 seconds to try to uh, come up with your own DFA.
Um, let's give me a DFA. And by DFA, whenever I say give me a DFA, I mean the diagram. I don't mean like the literal sets and things, because that's annoying and confusing. Give me the diagram for it. Uh, w is in sigma star. The number of A's in W is even. All right, let's take like 30 seconds. Give me DFA for this language. Two states would keep bouncing up and down. Okay. Do I, do I have to like say what lines to draw? <laughs> well, two states. Let's start with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bouncing up and down. Let's bounce left to right. You see an A, you transition. Yeah. You see an A, you untransition. So let's start with that. So this is a primitive we have. This is like a clock in some sense. Um, the number of A's will switch you between. Every time you see an A, you'll switch between the two states. But one of them should be accepting. Let's call this Q0. And let's call this Q1. Which state should be accepting? Q0. Q0 should be accepting. Is the empty string in this language? Yes. The number of A's in the empty string is 0. So yes. Um, now, if our alphabet is AB, we need A and B transitions. Where should we put those? On. Q0, if you see B, you should go back because your number of A's won't change. And then the same on the other side because your number of A's won't change. Right. Yes? Uh, I just have a question about like, the start state. So like for the start state, like do you need, it's like a small thing, but do you need like a line going to the start state? Yeah, that's just basically how we tell, that's just the notation we use for what the start state is. Okay. Sometimes you can just say the start state is Q0. Okay. Um, sometimes you can write a little word start here. Is, is Q0 not indicative that it's the first? When you do like the, when you typeset stuff on the homework, you just say this state is the start state, and it'll like do that automatically. It'll, it'll automatically put a tiny start word there for you. So it'll, Q0, I'm, I'm fair to assume is the start state. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to tell from the beginning how many states there are going to be? Uh, I love this question, because that is uh, CS brain syndrome. You're optimizing it. You're like, oh, maybe bigger DFA, smaller DFA. Um, yeah, kind of. You will see soon. Does it matter? Well, no, it doesn't matter. Actually, it doesn't. You can, OK, for, for simplicity for grading, please turn in a simple DFA. Um, but uh, the fact that the DFA exists at all is what we care about. Recall the language of prime numbers. Like, I don't know how to make a DFA for that. And we'll later, we'll prove there is no DFA for that. So the DF, the court, the, that says something about that language of primality. Like that, the fact there's no DFA for it. Essentially, if the DFA is a simple computer, and we prove there is no DFA for encodings of prime numbers, that means, in some sense, under this understanding, the encodings of prime numbers are not simple. So that's like a harder, more complex thing. That's sort of the perspective. It's not, op, it's not about optimality, but it, about the possibility. Yeah. But feel, feel, an extra state or two doesn't really. The DFA existence at all is, is, is the important part. Is this correct? Notice we, another thing, the self loop on B, we didn't go to a trash can or anything like that. We just sort of stayed at the same state. In some sense, the self loop, there's all kinds of programming analogies you can make. The self loop means ignore, right? If I see a B, I'm just going to ignore it. I don't, that doesn't affect the number of A's, so I'm done. Right. Questions on this one? Yes? Is that like size of Q or same or like matter? Like, can we compute different types of problems depending if like we only have like one symbol or two symbols? Yes, but that's also a CS brain question. Okay. So, in fact, um, uh, this is totally unrelated, but uh, Claude Shannon proved something analogous. Like, you can have an arbitrarily large alphabet and you only need three states for every problem you could want. So, imagine it. I mean, like, in some what is the alphabet of a real computer? It doesn't really do, a computer is not really binary. In some sense, it's base 64, because you have to write the whole register over again. So it does, the alphabet of a real computer is all 64 bit, 2 to the 64 minus 1 possible values that could go into a 64 bit string, 64 bit binary number. So the alphabet of a real computer isn't really 0 and 1, it's really 2 to the 64, or 2 to the whatever base it's currently using. So. Uh, and there's a reason that it does that and not, it, the word size of a computer is, not, is 
64 bits and not one bit. Because when it does one thing at a time, while the DFA may do one thing at a time, a computer does 64 things at a time. Right? So, yeah. Uh, do you not have to have an arrow for epsilon? Is it basically just go to start and then say, oh, there's nothing? So ah, it there is no epsilon. Epsilon is not a member of, it's, this is actually a great, a great fact. Epsilon is not an element of sigma, but epsilon is an element of sigma zero, and L epsilon is an element of sigma star. Those are strings of length zero. Yeah. That's the set of all strings. That's the set of strings of length one, the alphabet itself, A and B. It's not an element of there. Yeah. Slight difference between element of, subset of, and things like this, right? Um, yes. Wherever the, if the start state is accepting, then, then you know that the empty string is accepted. Right? Let's do another one. What is this? L3? L2? A to the N? n is even. And let's suppose sigma is equal to a, b, and not just a. Give me a DFA for this one. Um, so you start your start state. Q not. Um, and then you have like a second state that you're going to bounce between only with A's. Anytime you have a B, you immediately go to like a trash can. Yes. And your accepting state is your start one. Perfect. And then that too. You stay in the trash can. It has to be well defined. Right? The only difference between this one and the other one is this detail here. This one you ignore B's. This one you reject immediately. You see a B, it's over. Doomed. Throw, in the, throw it away. Input, it, it's like, imagine you had like if B immediately for just end computation, just return false. That's what this virtually is doing here. It's like throw, throw it away. You know, it's in here, it can never escape, and it's rejected. So. Question on this one? Kind of easy warm up so far, right? You guys could probably do a couple of these. All right, let's do a slightly more challenging one. <coughs> Let's do uh, L is uh, W is in sigma star, such that uh, the number of A's in W is congruent to 3 or 4 uh, uh, mod 7. Take 30 seconds on that one. How many states should we need? Seven. 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 Yeah. Here's a quick way to know how many states you'll need. The number of states, perhaps, in, at least in this one, is going to be the number of equivalence classes. So we'll have Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, and Q6. We don't need a Q7 because 7 mod 7 is 0. What's our strength state? Q0. Um, what's the transition between the states? What's our delta? Always the most important part is not the states, but the transitions. So you see an A, say in Q0, takes you to Q1. You see an A in Q1, takes you to Q2, et cetera. Awesome. We're just going to do a really big clock. We did the two, we did the two states for mod 2. For even, which is just congruent to 0 mod 2. So congruence to mod 7 is just going to be a clock between 7 states. 
right? Now we need to do, what are our B transitions? Yeah, just ignore it. Anytime you see a B, no matter what state you're in, just ignore it. Unfortunately, you have to do this for each state. You don't want to leave a state if you see a B to ignore it, uh, because that'll just, that'll, you'll forget what the number of A's you saw, right? And you only want to leave your state if you've seen uh, the number, uh, uh, the correct number of A's. What are the except states? Q3 and Q4. Q3 and Q4. Yeah. Pretty simple. Could you do this with uh, less states? I don't think so. Could you do it with only one accepting state? I also don't think so. I don't know if uh, I don't know of a smaller DFA for this task. Perhaps you should believe there isn't a smaller one. It seems reasonable. This is the smallest, right? You need two accept states for this one. I don't know how to do this with one accept state, right? Could go into three or four mod seven. Questions on this one? Oh, don't don't forget that. Forget that. That's for something. I'll answer. I'll have to come back to that much later on. That's there's trade-offs in certain different automata between state size and alphabet. Like if you make a really really big alphabet, you could do something else. Questions? Yeah. So the homework will never be asked. Like, could you do this in the states or how many states? Not really. I mean, okay. it's. I mean, it exists. It's good enough. Okay. Lazy programming is the best. The program exists at all, right? OK. Um, we mentioned this language probably doesn't have a DFA. Right? W is in sigma star. Uh, int of w, like the binary string casted is prime. And this is like one language that we probably, that we'll prove, uh, but for now, perhaps can give you some intuition about why there is no way to uh, decide this one. Can you give me a simpler language? A simpler, what is an even simpler language you can define that you think this computational model d does not have the ability of? Like, what can't this do? Basic things that a computer can do that you would expect a DFA not to do. Is it divisible by two or three? I think it's not possible. Divisible by two would simply, wouldn't that simply be mod? Uh, yeah. Okay, so actually that's the wrong answer. You can definitely do that one. <laughs> What's another one, though? What are some operations you think a computer could do that this one couldn't do? Addition. Addition. Uh, there's, it probably couldn't do addition. Depends on how formalized. So how would, remember it has to decide a language it has to accept or reject. So if we were to formalize addition as a decision problem, it depends if it could do it or not. Um, there's, an, there's another simpler operation that this DFA can't even do. Multiplication. Multiplication is actually harder than addition. Sorry. Objectively so. What are all the operations you can name? Well, it can't go back like it can't do subtraction. Uh, certainly couldn't do subtraction. Perhaps it, I'll tell you it can't do addition. It can't do subtraction. If formalized correctly, it's a decision variant. But what are some other operations more basic than addition or subtraction? Like counting. counting. So what I'll say is comparison. It could not compare two strings. It can't do uh, an arbitrary comparison or an equality. It can't do equality. The following language is uh, not, does not have a DFA to decide it. A to the n, b to the n, such that n is any number. And don't forget n is... Uh, zeros and natural. This is a language that, if a computer can decide this language, maybe it has the ability of equality, right? But this is one that it certainly doesn't. The DFA will prove very rigorously that the DFA can't, the no DFA exists for this one. But intuitively, you should be able to think that this, there is no DFA for this. Why? Well, you read left to right. The DFA, unfortunately, is forced to read left to right. It is going to have to read all the A's but it's going to have to remember all the A's. Not some of the A's, it's going to have to remember every single A that it saw. And then it has to match exactly uh, N B's to that. Not N plus 1 B's or N minus 1 B's or close to the N number of B's. It has to, not some function of N, exactly N. So unfortunately, it has to remember N things and then recall N things. Now, that's not a very formal proof, but intuitively you should see that there's probably no DFA for this. This is, it's, it's, it can't, it's, it's unfortunately limited. 
Um, so we already understand this is definitely not a good model of computation. It's a very toy one. It's a very weak one. Yeah? Two kind of maybe dumb questions, but could you uh, have like n squared states or something to encode? n squared states? n squared, I claim, is finite. Would you agree? Yeah. OK, so well, don't say n squared states. Fix the number of states. The number of states must be finite. So let's say nine states, three squared. Mm -hmm. But the language a to the n, b to the n is infinite. So there exists a string in this language of length 2 million. Would, this, would the DFA of nine states correctly accept the string of length a million? No. That's basically what happens. These, the language is infinite. The states are finite. It can only keep track up to a finite subset of this and not everything. It fails, unfortunately. Right. More questions on this? All right, let's do something useful uh, with DFAs. That was useful? Um, I mean, we talked about how weak they were. Actually, I guess computing modular arithmetic was pretty useful. DFAs can at least do one thing. Uh, they can do whatever a DFA can do. That's the one thing they can do. So maybe they can do whatever a DFA can do, but maybe one DFA can do, OK, a DFA can only do what a DFA can do. But a DFA can also do things that two DFAs can do. So what we're going to do is make one DFA to do, this, to do the job of two DFAs. So a DFA can do two DFAs at once. Can't do addition and multiplication. That's fine. It can do two things. We'll make it do two things. So this is called the, the, the Cartesian product simulation. If uh, DFA D1, which is equal to, let's say, Q sigma, we'll call it Q1 sigma 1 uh, delta 1, no, excuse me, Q01 uh, delta 1 and F1 uh, decides L1 and DFA And DFA uh, D2, uh, Q2, let's just make sigma the same to make this simple. Uh, Q0, 2, a delta 2, and F2 decides L2. We give a DFA D is equal to Q, sigma, uh, Q0, uh, delta, and F to decide uh, L1 intersect L2. So let there be a one language decidable by a DFA. Let there be a second language decidable by probably a different DFA. We can give one DFA, and the DFA's job is to run both DFAs at the same time and decide the intersection. It's going to only accept when both DFAs accept. But here we see one, one DFA can simulate two other DFAs. This is a, called simulation, right? It's a hard-coded program, but it simulates two other programs. Question? No? OK. How is this going to work? We're basically going to move between the states as if we were moving between the states of both DFAs. So the, the states of the DFA for the intersection is going to be the Cartesian product of the states of both DFAs. So this is going to be Q1 times Q2. Sigma is going to be sigma. It's the same. Thankfully, I defined it. You could do it if you had different alphabets, but like for simplicity, let's just make them the same alphabet. Now, if you have, uh, what's our start state going to be then? Q not one, Q not two. It's going to be representing the element of Q one times Q two, which is the start states of both of them. So we're going to start in both the <laughs> face simultaneously. Q zero one, Q. 0, 2, something like that. And um, again, the formal definition is always slightly complicated, but when you, we'll do an example as well. It'll make, it'll make obvious how this one DFA does two things at, at once. Um, here's the hard part. Delta of, it takes on a state, which is represented by a Cartesian product, QI, QJ, comma, A, right? Excuse me. 
right? So the transition function takes on a state and a symbol, and it outputs a state. But what state should that be? The state it outputs should be as if it moved between both transition functions simultaneously. So this transition function is going to be a function of the two transition functions. So it's going to move in the first coordinate as if it moved through the first DFA, and it's going to move in the second coordinate as it moved through the second DFA. Delta 1, Q, I, A, delta 2, Q, J, A, where Q, I is in Q1, Q, J is in Q2. Right. That's the hard part. Do we agree that that moves between both DFAs? moves in the first coordinate according to the first transition function, and the second coordinate according to the second transition function. What should our final states be? We want to accept when both DFAs accept. So what states, what subset of Q1 times Q2 accept both DFAs? What is the name of that set theory? Intersection. Um, in terms of F1 and F2, what is that? Is it just the tuple? Of it on the... It's going to be, I think you guys are saying the same thing. It's going to be F1 times F2. F1 is the final state of DFA1. F2 is the final state of DFA2. F1 times F2 is a subset of Q1 times Q2, where both states are accepting. Right. I thought F1 was just one state. F1 is a subset of states. Oh, you can. Have more than one oh, this was state. the discussion you were having on before of whether, okay, I get yeah. it. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this is one, for example, is two accept states. So oh, here, right, right, right. in this one, F would be Q3, Q4, like that, the denotion. Okay. So this, uh, we're not going to prove it, does correctly simulate two DFAs simultaneously. We'll do not a proof. We'll do something called proof by example, which is not a proof. But it's going to be sufficient to convince you that it's correct. Let's see that button. So let's do um, uh, W's and sigma star, uh, W ends with a B, with not A, B, but B. What is the DFA for this? Let's call this uh, Q0 and Q1. And if we see a B, we're going to go to Q1. What's the rest of the transitions for this DFA? A, you go back to Q0, and if you see a B in Q1, you stay in Q1. Yeah, you're prepared to end there. And if you see an A in Q0, you stay in Q0. Exactly. If you see a B, great, until you see an A, then not great. But if you see a B, get prepared to end. What about L2? Uh, w is in sigma star. Uh, the number of Bs in W is even. Hint, two states. We did one like this already. Uh, what's the transitions? Let's call this, just to be different, we'll call this Q2 and Q3, just to be different. What are the transitions between Q2 and Q3? We want the number of Bs to be even. In Q2, when you see a B, you go to Q3. And if you see a B there, you go back. And then if you see an A, you stay where you are on either one. Yeah. And These are very Q2 similar DFAs. And Q2 is accepting, right? Yeah. OK. These are two DFAs. Uh, let's make a DFA for the intersection. It's going to simulate both simultaneously. We're going to have how many states? Four. Now, 0, 2, 0, 3, this is a shorthand for Q0, comma Q2. 
but that's what it is. Um, what's our start state? We, each of these states is going to, we're going to go between these states as if we were going through two DFAs simultaneously. So when we go from one state to another, it's as if we're going in those two DFAs from one state to another in each. So we need to start in both DFAs at the same time. What is the start state of this DFA, according to the formal definition even? Yeah. Zero two. Zero two is the start state. OK. Um, let's just get, it'll do, let's do the transitions, and then we'll talk about the final states in a second. If you're at a zero two and you see an A, where do you go? You want to go wherever you'll see an A in both, right? So if you were in this one and you saw an A, you stayed in Q0. If you were in this one and you saw an A, you stayed in Q2. So if you're in 0, 2 and you see an A, you stay. Do we understand that? If you're in 0 and you're in 2 and you see an A, you're in 0 and you're in 2. So you're in 0, 2. Now, if you're in 0, 2 and you see a B, where do you go? 1, 3. Why? Because here, Q0, B, you go to 1. And in Q, and from Q2, you see B, you go to 3. So when you see a B in Q0, 2, you're going to go to state 1, 3. Notice, this is one transition. But because we have quadratically many states, finite state, finite state, multiply those together, that's a finite state machine. You're going from one state to another, but it's pretending it's went from 2 DFAs, one state to one state. 0, 2 to 1, 3. One transition, right? Let's finish the table. 0, 3, you see an A. Where do you go? You stay in 0, 3. 0, 3, you see a B. Where do you go? I have the answers, so I've already done, already worked this one out. Um, we need to well, it needs to be well defined. If you're in one three and you see an A, where do you go? Zero three. Yes. If you're in uh, one three and you see a B. One two. If you're in one two and you see an A. And if you're in 1, 2, and you see a B. Yeah. Uh, what are our accepting states? Those are going to be the ones that are both Q1 and Q2 simultaneously, so it's 1, 2. I want you to investigate the computation of this DFA really closely with a microscope and notice how the simulation actually works. Right? Notice that you can switch between 1, 2, 1, 2 like this when you see a B, right? So what does it mean to be in 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 2 to 1, 3? That basically means you're not switching state 1, but you are switching state 2 for 3 and back. That's the same thing as here. You're not switching state 1, but you're switching between 2 and 3 and back, right? So this double transition here is basically the same thing as the double transition here, right? That's the same thing. Now, unfortunately, if you're in 0, 2, and you see a B, it changes both DFAs, and not just one of them. It changes the top one by if you need to end on a B or not. But it changes the bottom one for the number of Bs as well. That's basically how this does this. And what, although that's a logical, the, the intersection is a set operation. It's got a logical uh, equivalence. What is the meaning of an intersection again? It's like if it's both, right? It's and. So this DFA will accept strings that what? That end with a B and have an even number of Bs. It keeps back, it track of both of those things. So using a small DFA, we build a big DFA. Right? We have uh, immediately a DFA for the intersection. We can build, how would you build a DFA for the union? What would, there's only a small change you need to make. Change your accepting states to be like the accepting states of the, the union of the accepting states. It's hard to define that mathematically. But the intersection is uh, F1 times F2. For the union, you want to accept if either DFA accepts. So you want Q1 or Q2. So that would include uh, Q1 
q13 and 02 as well. So the way you would define that mathematically, unfortunately, is not polite. It's like q1 times f2 union f1 times q2, something like this. That would do, that would do the or instead of the and. Awesome. So we see immediately that DFAs have a property of intersection and union, right? Um, let me do it right here. We let L, we, we'll use this notation, the curly L and the word DFA to mean this is called a class. This is not a language. This is a set of languages. This is called the class of languages decidable. By DFAs. How do I do a curly L in LaTeX? Um, math SCR, I think. I'll give it. I'll give it in the in the notes. Okay. Something. It'll it'll be there. By the way, in general, you can use a website called Detexify. You were right. Detexify. Is it math SCR? Yeah. Okay. Great. Detexify, by the way, will will tell you like handwriting. It'll re recognize your handwriting and tell you what symbol it is. I have one called MathTix. Same thing. Okay. Is that sounds like Mac Tix? No, Math. Oh, okay. Um, right, class of language is decidable by DFAs, and only DFAs. So what this means is like, if L is in LDFA, there is a DFA to decide L. Right. Because of the construction is so general, we can talk about the existence of DFAs without having to build it, right? Um, uh, if L1, L2, is, are elements of LDFA, what do we know is also an element of LDFA by the proof we just did? The intersection, L1 intersect L2 is an element of LDFA. L1 Union L2 is an element of LDFA. For any two languages that have DFAs. If you have two languages that have DFAs, there's a DFA for the intersection. If you have two languages that have DFAs, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a DFA for the union. We didn't even build the DFA, but we know it exists. This is a crazy part. We can, just, we can just sort of hypothesize, wow, I could write that code if I wanted to, but I'm not going to. Great part about not having to program it. I could do it if I want to, but I'm not going to. There's another, there's another we would say that the, the class of LDFA, there's a name for this. It's called the regular languages. A language is regular if there exists a DFA for it. They're called regular. Uh, we know that the class of regular languages is closed under intersection. It's closed under union. It's closed under something else. Set difference. Set difference, just because it's closed under inter union intersection. There's another one, a more primitive operation is closed under. Concatenation, the proof of that will take us another lecture. But yes, it's closed under concatenation. But there's a simpler operation, a set theoretic operation it's closed under. Complement. Why? Because you just reverse the accepting states. The DFA, no string can land on two states simultaneously. So no string is both accepted and not accepted. The DFA always accepts, that's the deterministic part, or it always rejects. It doesn't ever change its mind. It's always accepting it or it's always rejecting it. It's never like wishy-washy on that, right? So if you take any DFA and you flip the, the, the accepting states, congrats, you've built the DFA for the complement of the language. If you have any program that, always, that can always return true and return false, you have a program for the opposite behavior by just control F replacing con, return true with return false. If you swap those two substrings around, congrats, you've done the opposite problem, right? That's true only in decision problems, not in like search problems or anything. But you, have, you can build a DFA for the complement just by flipping the states. You agree? You set f to be q minus f. Congrats. New DFA. We proved that there's DF, the, the regular languages are closer and <coughs> complement. I didn't build a DFA for it, but I suppose you could replace every double circle with a single circle and every single circle with a double circle, QED. Right? Any questions on the Cartesian product construction? A little complicated, but I hope the example is clearer than the, the formal construction. It's usually how it goes. Awesome. I will see you guys on Thursday.